In my view, the question of what is the right protocol is a war that is being foisted on by vendors and, and salespeople. In spite of the suit, I'm not a salesperson, I'm a technical person. Um, the answer varies customer by customer. But what we are finding universally true across the broad customer base is the choice is a mix between block and, and NAS storage for VMware. Each one has got certain uniqueness that you can't do one way or the other. Very simple to create very large NFS data stores that span ESX clusters. That's very difficult to do with VMFS. In fact, today it's impossible. Um, conversely, a lot of these vStorage APIs currently are focused on the block use case. So it's, for most customers, the right answer is a mix. And then the questions that customers ask us is, what's the right answer for me? Is it iSCSI? Is it Fiber? Is it FCOE for block? And the answer, unfortunately, once again, is a technical one, which is that it depends. What we're finding is customers who don't have existing infrastructure tend to go the iSCSI route. Customers with existing fiber channel SANs tend to leverage that. And people who are refreshing are looking at fiber channel over Ethernet. But universally, there's a few things that you need to think about from a best practices standpoint. It becomes very, very important to leverage all of the things that you can do to make your environment more efficient. So things like thin provisioning, things like array-based replication, which currently we integrate with Virtual Center and with ESX APIs to be able to back up and restore VMs using array-based replicas that are consistent. Um, leveraging technologies like dedupe, where they can apply. Um, you know, it varies vendor by vendor where you can apply dedupe, but you should apply it wherever you can, because you're trying to make your environment as efficient as you can. Backup targets are where we focus dedupe initially at EMC. And we've seen that as a huge cost saving for all of our customers. When you're looking at IP storage and IP multipathing, you've got to read the best practices very carefully. Until the next major release of virtual infrastructure, return multipathing with IP is, is difficult. You can do good load balancing on the outbound. Inbound lo load balancing can be difficult, but there are ways. You need to think about how you configure your iSCSI or your NAS targets to have multiple IPs on different subnets, different VM kernel ports and interfaces. But what's really important is you start to think about how do I build today for the N plus one state? Think about building blocks. Building blocks allow you to accelerate the deployment of your infrastructure to make it simpler and easier to operationalize. What do I mean by that? Here's an example. So as Cisco and VMware and EMC, some of our largest customers said, we love all the technology you guys have got. You need to make it simpler for us to just get going with it, right? So we built what we call this VPod, which is designed for this top of rack design, unified fabric with all the layers pre-characterizing using tools like VMMark, LoadGen for Exchange, you know, and tools to, to generate SQL Server and SharePoint workloads, that sort of stuff. So you can say, this unit is pre-qualified for X number of VMs, X number of virtual desktops, and these key applications with this sort of workload. The key thing is, is that what we found is that we did that for one customer, and then customer after customer started to say, that would be very useful. Can you please share that? And so as an example, this document, which if anybody wants to read it, come and grab me after the event, basically says step by step at every layer. So for example, here are the Nexus OS and CAT OS commands that you have to do to configure the switches. There's other stuff in here that have to do with the EMC side, and there's a ton of stuff in here that has to do with the VMware side, right? Because in the end, the solution is actually all three of us together. Now, currently, the top of rack is focused on iSCSI and NFS. And if you go and you take a look at this document, each one of the servers has got six cables coming out the back, right? So what we're trying to do as we do vPod version 2 is some of the stuff that Ed is going to be talking about shortly. And that's currently underway in Hoffington and a very, very fun project. So the other thing that I think is useful is, and I'm going to pass the baton here to you, Scott, to tell this story about, you know, how to prove that ESXIO can really scale up. So uh, thanks, Chad. So we've been doing a lot of work with uh, improving aspects of our underlying uh, virtualization technology for running mainstream production mission critical apps, and none more importantly than I.O. With 3.5, we've, we've done a lot of work on our I.O. stack in order to improve the amount, the throughput, and uh, latency of applications. So we wanted to see how far we actually had gotten. So we got together with our buddies in uh, Hopkinton, and we put together a test where we took a single uh, Intel server with 16 cores and created a synthetic benchmark, iometer, running each on 16 VMs, each dedicated to one processor, in order to see how much I.O. could we actually drive with this uh, 3.5 version. 
We took what was classically a database kind of workload mix, so 8K block size, random read-write mix, and we started working against, we were running against clarion arrays. And uh, we initially had a one array, and we were spindle-bound. So we wound up adding a second array and a third array. We actually topped out on, on 500 disks across three racks before we were actually, actually IO-bound in ESX on the adapters in the server. So to give you a feel for how much 100,000 IOs is in that size uh, Intel server, that's enough IOs for 200,000 exchange mailboxes or consolidating 70 production databases. Now, nobody in their right mind would tell you to put that many VMs on a single system. But what that really shows is IO bottlenecks is not an issue with VMware today with 3.5. And as, uh, and, uh, as Steve Herod mentioned uh, in his keynote earlier today, we're not stopping there. And in a couple of minutes, I'll tell you more about the future of IO. IO. Betcha. Um, and of course, uh, our, our VMware friends were ecstatic with this result. Uh, the EMC team was a little bummed out, right? Because the, the CX380 was our, you know, high-end mid-range array, and one itty-bitty ESX server, you know, was basically saturating three of them, right? So, um, you know, th those, those are the points that, you know, we were talking about there, and you can find the details on that on the VMware team's performance blog, and again, you can see the comment here, guys. We're not advocating this as a best practice. This is us working together to learn what are the operational limits Right? Yep. You need to know that. You need to push the envelope to figure out what works best for everybody. But of course, what are we doing now? If you saw in Steve Harrod's thing, it said future 200,000 IOPS. Of course, there's a CX4 now in there with solid state drives and a DMX4 to say, OK, if you really want to play, guys, you know, we, can, <laughs> we can come to the party too. Um, but I want to show you something, I think, a little more practical for everybody here. right? For the last two or three years within EMC, all the engineering teams have been basically saying whether you're a storage team, whether you're a management tool team or a backup team, we need to start thinking about designing products for the world where most hosts are ESX host attached and most workloads are actually VMs. And that changes how you design products. So the CX4 product was the first product to ship you know, with that new kind of core philosophy in mind. And let me show you a practical example of uh, how you design a product for that use case. 